Next up is another star. Uh, Dr. C. Wayne McElwraith is uh, from Colorado State University with, uh, you can read all the titles he has there. And he's going to talk about corticosteroids, which of course is, uh, is very much in the news, uh, has been for years and certainly is now. Dr. R McElwraith. Thank you, Ed, and thanks for the invitation to uh, speak uh, at the meeting. Um, so, I was asked to talk about corticosteroids in the horse and training and racing. Um, just a couple of definitions. Obviously, they're, they're the most potent anti-inflammatory agents used to treat a broad range of medical conditions in the horse. They do have a substantial place in practice of veterinary medicine. The appropriate use and the regulation of corticosteroids in all equine competitions, racing and non-racing, is, is a very current issue. Um, as are the welfare issues, um, and, and they're a subject of intense research and review. So I'm, there's a renewed attention on corticosteroids. It's not new as far as them uh, being accused of various things, um, of them being reflected in a negative light, and I'll come back to some of that. The RMTC has been addressing uh, uniformity ever since the, the RMTC was formed uh, over 10 years ago. But I think we now may be getting somewhere, and these two publications or recent contributions uh, are critical to that process. The New York uh, Task Force on Racehorse Health and Safety, the, the official report of which is a, a phenomenal production. A lot of work that that panel done, and they should be congratulated, and I'll come back and sort of reflect on that a little at the end of the talk. And also, of course, the Jockey Club recommendations that have been updated um, with regard to medication, and that's also a very thorough and uh, another indication that we're starting to put a little bit more teeth into the corticosteroid issue. Coincidentally, it was interesting, I, I got on the plane in Paris last Wednesday coming back from doing some work in France, and this was the, the lead article in at least the European version of USA Today. And anabolic steroids, of course, everybody knows, have had a lot of attention, but Corticosteroids haven't generally, and um, I'm having trouble reading that from here, but I thought the two interesting statements just in this front page was uh, the fact that they were pointing out that they could have side effects, that they certainly ease pain, but what are the long-term effects? And up above was this uh, baseball player was describing, professional baseball player was stating how at the end of the season, he gets some cortisone shots to, to fix him up. And the, and the point there is that a lot of the dilemma with, with horse racing is the fact of using it within competition or within competition time versus using it as a therapy, which is the appropriate use. So at least this person was getting treated with cortisone at the end of the season. As far as earlier directives, thoroughbred horse racing, the thoroughbred horse racing industry continued to come under scrutiny, it has continued for a long time. It led to congressional attention, particularly after uh, the uh, tragic injury with eight bells in the Kentucky Derby, preceded by Barbaro. The AAP Racing Task Force was formed at that time and is now a standing committee and has done a lot of, uh, at least done a lot of uh, directives and we've uh, produced a white paper regarding practice at the racetrack. The RMTC and other organizations have responded as well. There's been progress made. Anabolic steroids have been banned, at least banned from the time of competition. But intra-articular use of corticosteroids has recurred as a focus of attention. Now, this is obvious to most, but not always to some, and certainly gets confused in the press and by other pe the public. Anabolic steroids are not corticosteroids. Anabolic Corticoster uh, sorry, that should be corticosteroids, anabolic steroids, we shouldn't have corticosteroids in there, cannot be used in competition, and they're only available as a therapy separate from competition. That same distinction doesn't hold for corticosteroids. Because of these uh, requests, uh, well, the interest that was regained recently, uh, the AAP Racing Committee and the RMTC decided that they needed some critical review of the scientific data regarding intra-articular corticosteroids, and this led to the production of a white paper. 
And then I turned that into a refereed publication that's been published in the Equine Veterinary Journal. And so this is available if people uh, want detail. Hopefully, uh, what I'm giving you here is a little more digestible. So there's been divided opinions on intra-articular corticosteroids. The proponents, of course, will say that it's needed to decrease inflammation, musculoskeletal pain, ongoing joint degradation, and opposite limb overload. The opponents will say, well, they're merely masking pain and lead to joint deterioration. So we'll examine both sides of that story because there are differences within different corticosteroids. So just a little bit about indications. The main use of uh, corticosteroids is intra-articularly and we get various stages of traumatic arthritis and osteoarthritis in high motion joints. It's a very common problem. It's been estimated that 60% of retirements of athletes, at least in the United States, is due to uh, osteoarthritis, which is the progressive loss of articular cartilage that happens at the end of a stage of a cycle of inflammation. And we have various tissues in the joint that, uh, and, but the important part is you have the ends of the bone covered by cartilage, and Larry has just talked about subchondral bone disease. That's often the initiating part. The joints and organ and all these tissues can become affected, but the primary condition that the veterinarian at the racetrack is asked to look at first is synovitis, inflammation of the synovial membrane, which is the lining of the joint capsule that holds the bones together. The lining produces the hyaluronic acid. So in what I've called stage one osteoarthritis, we have synovitis, but no morphologic change in the cartilage. I'm trying to find out, where's the pointer on this? Oh, this one here, sorry, thanks. And so, this is the fibrous joint capsule, this is the lining membrane, the red reflects inflammation, and this is a common time when intra-articular therapy is performed. <coughs> and as you go on longer, the synovitis is a bit less acute, but you start getting fibrosis in the joint capsule, and you get morphologic damage in the articular cartilage commencing. This is reflected here and histologically here, we start getting what we call fibrillation in the superficial layer. And then here we have stage three where the synovitis is chronic and there's increasing morphologic damage. If we look at it arthroscopically, we start seeing very obvious change in the cartilage. And here histologically, this is the complete layer, this is the bone down here. We're starting to get half, you know, damage halfway down the layer. And then stage four is when we've got chronic synovitis we'll have, and this will be reflected in decreased ability to flex the joint, and full thickness loss of articular cartilage, as you can see here, where the fibrillation goes down to the bone, the pieces break away. Now, intra-articular corticosteroids are used at all those stages, but the, the response and the length of response is gonna be progressively less as you get into those progressive stages. The important part of what we're treating is synovitis and capsulitis. Usually they're both present. In other words, we, we have inflammation in the synovial membrane, which is the lining layer, but the fibrous joint capsule is also affected. It's common in the athlete, it gives you pain and dysfunction, which is the immediate thing that the trainer sees, that the veterinarian looks at, but what's equally important, or probably more important for the long-term uh, soundness of the horse is that this inflamed synovial membrane produces these deleterious mediators, and this is what can cause progressive loss of articular cartilage. Now, there's other causes to loss of articular cartilage, but this is the insidious one that generally is the most important. Of course, there may or may not be concomitant injury or disease in the cartilage or bone, such as a fracture and specifying the diagnosis and deciding what the degree of other changes and the distal palmar metacarpal disease that Larry talked about as one of these important ones um, is an important part of treatment because otherwise your treatment's gonna be limited, you've got to have limited effect. So there's a lot of mediators involved in the degradation of the articular cartilage. Uh, there won't be a test after this, but um, the important thing is just to make it simple is that we now know that the bad guy with osteoarthritis is interleukin-1. It acts on these receptors on the, on the cells, 
and produces these other products which cause breakdown of the collagen and the proteoglycan of the cartilage. The trainer probably thinks they, they want to see return to function of the horse when intra-articular corticosteroids are given. But the important thing is the long-term game is to prevent or minimize osteoarthritis. So then you get into the issue of beneficial effects versus harmful effects, which I'll come back to in a minute. The goal of treatment in all traumatic joint entities is to return the joint to normal as quickly as possible, prevent the occurrence or reduce the severity of osteoarthritis. In other words, reduce pain and minimize progression of joint deterioration by minimizing those mediators that come from the inflamed synovial membrane as well as timely removal of these other things. If we've got a chip fracture, that's not gonna be treated effectively with corticosteroids. That's gonna be arthroscopic surgery. Fixation of an intra-articular fracture, such as a condylar fracture. Accurate diagnosis of other injuries. Obviously, the meniscus is limited to the stifle. It's a huge problem. It's not so much of a problem in thoroughbred racehorses, but it's a huge problem in some other athletes. So the current status of corticosteroids is they're still used frequently. Untoward effects are generalized and often fictitious. fictitious. This is my simple diagram. I'll come back to details regarding this. And the commonly used ones have received controlled studies, which is an important part of the science and what's improved our knowledge. I put this key argument up before, proponents arguing that therapy is necessary to decrease inflammation and musculoskeletal pain, as I've reflected to you before. Um, avoid overloading of the opposite limb is a theory, but Larry's already brought that up with regard to pain in the joint leading to other problems because of different loading. Opponents feel they are merely masking pain. I'm certainly obviously in the first camp, but before we go any further, certainly there are some drugs that have negative effects, and I'll show you those. The critical issues are that the corticosteroids are still an important part of therapy, and sometimes the best option. We've got some other therapies that I'll briefly allude to, but uh, they're still an important part of practice. There are side effects with some products. Not all corticosteroids are the same. Those go together, and I'll explain that. They are potent and long-acting, and I think that's hugely important when we start discussing the need or the use of them very close to competition. And this is not my original statement, but uh, I, um, I had it given to me uh, by Jamie Hayden, but I think it's really good. There needs to be a point where therapy ends and competition begins. And of course, that's part of the dilemma we have. So, First of all, I want to talk about a little bit of history and then go through the, uh, what we know as far as what effect these have, positive and negative, on the joint. So they've obviously been around for a while. They were firstly, first described by Dr. J.D. Wheat, whose name's on the, the orthopedic uh, research lab that Dr. Stover heads up at UC Davis. He described the use of hydrocortisone, which is a relatively low-potency corticosteroid. Then there were a lot of studies done by an investigation team headed up by Van Pelt uh, in the 1960s, showing the effect of different corticosteroids and their ability to reduce inflammation in the horse. There's been some clinical trials, generally poorly controlled, published. And of course, the indictments against corticosteroids started some time ago, and so this was initially, the initial paper that sort of pointed out negative effects was an endless destructive cycle is set into motion, I don't know how we got two words there, but which have continued will produce a steroid arthropathy which can render the horse useless. Now this was published in a veterinary journal by a veterinarian, but he quoted an anonymous reference. It was actually in the journal of AMA, uh, an abstract in 1958. And the term steroid arthropathy has been around for a long time. And when it was first described, it was compared to Charcot arthropathy, which is a, a condition in man associated with denervation and most commonly associated, not seen much anymore, I believe, but uh, with syphilis. 
And then, of course, this was another quote from a textbook that a, a textbook that a horse can wear a joint surface right down to the bone, running on a glucocorticoid injected joint. So, this is when I met reality as far as intra-articular corticosteroids. I got my veterinary degree in New Zealand. The lecture, this lecture was very short. Corticosteroids, don't use them. Phenylbutazone, don't use that. So. Um, then I sort of got into doing a surgical residency and, and got trained in that and then started doing surgery and then get more involved with the equine industry. And this, this little story is about the best example I know of, of clinical observation causing a question of, of dogma and then leading to scientific investigation to really see if it's true. So this started in 1983 when I was first uh, asked to come down by Dr. Nancy Goodman and do arthroscopic surgery on some racing quarter horses, uh, multiple joint chips. Um, arth the arthroscopy was made for that. You can see that it was quite a long time ago. We're looking directly through the scope. And I was doing a surgery with Dr. Baker, who was her boss, who owned the clinic uh, down in Orange County, California. And I said, well, this joint looks really good. So it couldn't have had any corticosteroids because I was brought up with the idea that if you use corticosteroids, they fell apart. And he said, I've injected that horse 20 times, or at least 20 times. Now, he'd used Betavet, and this was relevant to the discussion, which is now called Celestone Soluspan. It's a betamethasone thing. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So I went back to CSU and said, we need to do some research on this. So there'd been a number of studies done prior to that time. This one by Trotter et al. was a study that I was involved in at CSU, where we put methylprednisolone acetate or depamedrol into joints um, and showed that there were some negative effects on the cartilage. However, we felt that it needed to be re-studied in osteoarthritis, a hypothesis being that perhaps the, the beneficial effects of inhibiting inflammation would outweigh the negative effects directly on the cartilage matrix. So in summary, we've looked at these three products, and I'll show you the results of each one with doing more recent research, and we've seen the beneficial effects and the deleterious effects both in vivo, in the horse, but also done some in vitro work confirming that. So the, because this was the drug that in California we'd seen um, they were using, the veterinarians were using a lot in, in the horse, um, we decided to study that first and we created a chip fragment on the distal radial carpal bone, treadmilled the horses. It's a model that we've modified since that first study, but it gives us a very consistent level of insidious osteoarthritis without severe lameness. And we compared Betavet Soluspan, uh, now called Celestone, as I said before, in both joints. And what we showed was that there was no deleterious effects on the cartilage. But what was really interesting, the group that looked the best as far as the, the, uh, the cartilage histologically and with staining for glycosamine and glycan, which are an important component of cartilage, uh, the exercised horses with corticosteroids looked the best. So this was consistent with what had been seen. And then we went on and did a number of studies. Well, we've done a lot of studies with different products. Um, we're just talking about corticosteroids today and Chris Kauchak on my left and Dave Frisbee on my right. Uh, they were residents at the time. They're still with me. Um, we modified the model, but the important part is, is that we, we looked at the remote effects by injecting the opposite joint as well as the injected joint. And so we had three groups, and this was interesting because it shows the potency of these products, uh, both directly in the joint as well as administered elsewhere. So just quickly, with, with methylprednisolone acetate or depamedrol, we looked at that. Um, all horses treated on 14 and day 28. Treadmilling starts at 15 days and goes on for six weeks. So we assess them at 70 days which is four weeks after the, sec the last injection. We had lower but not significant reduction in lameness. This was a bit equivocal because we had variation. However, we had lower PG2 concentrations. We still had significant anti-inflammatory effects in the joint four weeks after the last injection. 
we also had less inflammation in the synovial membrane. When I've got an asterisk here, these were significant differences. But the modified Mankin scores, which is a histopathologic index, in other words, an index of cartilage disease or cartilage degradation was significantly increased. So all these changes were day 70. We still had significant anti-inflammatory effects from that last injection, but we had negative effects in the cartilage, and these are just some graphs of that with significant PG2. The other thing to note, so this is the group where we've actually injected the joint with the osteoarthritis. This group, we've injected the opposite knee, and we still got a significant effect, a significant anti-inflammatory effect, and we also got, uh, and this is just a picture of the synovitis, and we also got significant increase in the Mankin scores. And you see, when the letters are different, that's a significant difference at the P0.05 level. Dr. Parkin gave a nice introduction to the statistical stuff whether we put it in the same joint or in the opposite joint. So two things out of this, it caused degradation to the cartilage and it also could be, uh, it was also effective still four weeks after injection and it also could be effective, cause damage to that joint when given remotely. And similarly, we showed increase in gag loss from the cartilage, which is another reflection of articular cartilage breakdown and decrease synthesis, this turnover of the glycosaminoglycans, they make up the proteoglycans, which give you compressive strength in your cartilage. Triamcinolone, on the other hand, we did the same model of study. We had significant reduction in lameness. It was decreased when we gave it in the opposite joint, but not significantly. It was significantly decreased at day 70, uh, given in that joint. So again, we're four weeks after the last injection had no negative effects on the articular cartilage, and in fact had decreased gag levels in the fluid, reflecting decreased breakdown and increased levels of gag synthesis. We think this was a reflex thing in the opposite joint. I haven't got time to sort of discuss the details, but the bottom line is that every one of our parameters that were affected were positively affected. We had decreased cartilage disease and we had uh, decreased inflammation. So the overall results were very favorable and they showed that we still had a reflection of potency because we had significant reduction of that inflammation four weeks after the last injection. Now, a lot of, a lot of veterinarians have taken notice of this work, but this was a survey that we published last year at Equine Vet Journal where we surveyed AAP members, the majority we're using triamcinolone to treat high motion joints and 73% used MPA. There's also a growing number that are using betamethasone products. Sport horse and Western performance veterinarians are significantly more likely to use TA in high motion joints. We're recommending they don't use depo in high motion joints. And triamcinolone use compared to methylprednisolone was significantly lower with racehorse veterinarians compared to other veterinarians. So what about the use of corticosteroids? There's been, in low motion joints, there's been this traditional concept that it's okay to use it in a low motion joint, a low motion joint like the distal joints of the tarsus, uh, which are commonly injected. They don't provide a lot of motion. Some people have said somewhat cynically that they're there to get osteoarthritis, maybe so, but there's no evidence that uh, methylprednisolone acetate can promote ankylosis. Some people argue, well, if the, if the depomedrol causes damage to the cartilage, that's okay, um, it'll ankylose. But these, are, these drugs do not promote healing, and I think it's questionable. The question that others would have is why not preserve the articular cartilage if you can? And this is a study, now it's not big numbers, but it was significant differences where they compared triamcinolone or vetilog with methylprednisolone acetate or depomedrol and showed that the days of improvement of lameness with either one were not significantly different. In other words, the idea that you've got to use methylprednisolone in the distal tarsus um, is not validated by this study. Now, I'm just going to quickly acknowledge that there are other combinations of therapy, uh, and certainly the, the HA, the idea of hyaluronic acid with 
Intraarticular corticosteroids is a good combination. We've shown in this study that in the same model, we get significantly less cartilage fibrillation with hyaluronan. If we compared hyaluronan to saline, we also showed uh, marked anti-inflammatory with in effects with intraarticular adequan. So we do have alternatives. However, it's not published yet, but we've also shown that the combination of adequan and corticosteroids is not as good as either of them alone. So there's still, but definitely with the combination of HA and corticosteroids, um, there's some logic to it. And this is just some pictures from the comparative study showing healthier cartilage in both the HA and the adequan treated groups compared to the controls. The one thing that's been around for a while that I think this work refutes is that HA is not going to mitigate against the de deleterious effects of Depo-Pedro um, at all. Newer biological therapies are around. They do offer alternatives in countries where the withdrawal time is a lot longer for corticosteroids being used. IRAP, for instance, is a product that increases the amount of interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, the natural antagonist of interleukin-1, and that is an alternative that's being used in France a lot, for instance, because of the longer withdrawal time. So we have alternatives as well. One of the big questions, or one of the last big questions to address is the association of intraarticular corticosteroids and catastrophic injury. There's been two studies done looking in normal joints. This was an offshoot of our triamcinolone study where we looked at the bone uh, in the chip fragment model and showed no deleterious effects on the subchondral bone. There's no effects of depamedrol on bone in uh, either um, on bone in a study done by Rachel Murray at the Animal Health Trust. Now that's important because systemic use of corticosteroids in, in humans can often lead to avascular necrosis. And so there's been a reasonable suggestion from time to time as to what kind of harm, what kind of risk is the horse at. So is there any evidence of an association between local administration of corticosteroids and musculoskeletal injury? Those two studies I showed you were in horses with induced disease, or in triamcinolone it was induced disease, and the other ones it was just normal joints being injected. And this is a paper that was presented at ICRAF, and, and uh, Rick Arthur passed me on the abstract, and Tim Parkin was an author on this paper. It was done in Australia, and 1,911 horses were involved, three veterinary practices, 36 trainers, and the hazard of a musculoskeletal injury in horses after receiving a local corticosteroid injection. Some of the injections were into tendon sheaths, other synovial structures, as well as joints, but the majority were in joints. Usually for the treatment of a pre-existing musculoskeletal condition is five times that in untreated horses and horses prior to treatment. But the authors did comment, and also interestingly enough, after multiple local corticosteroid injections, the injury rate is approximately twice that compared to a single injection. So this is a quote that I took directly from the abstract, so you didn't think I was putting my own spin on it. But these higher hazards are most likely due to the progression of pre-existing of the pre-existing condition, but further study is required, and this is what the authors said because this is the first time that there's actually been a clinical study uh, looking at the two factors. And, but obviously, the corticosteroids are being used to treat a condition there's already a problem. And so you've got to you know, weigh up the relative importance of either. Pharmacokinetics of corticosteroids and duration of pharmacologic action. I think I've already made the point from our other research projects. There's people looking at, I definitely feel that we can see if we look at comparative pharmacologic studies that have been done with intraarticular triamcinolone at least, and we've looked at the effects we got from therapy, the effects go considerably beyond the stage of being detected in the joint. Can we? extrapolate pharmacokinetic data into biologic potency. There's been a couple of ways of looking at this. Dr. Somer in Pennsylvania has uh, published, I'll just pass on to this, pharmacokinetics, where they're looking at hydrocortisone lowering, so that's a natural 
corticosteroid and endogenous corticosteroid being significantly reduced as a reflection of the body saying, I don't need to produce as much because I've got this exogenous corticosteroid going in there. And this is another exciting area of looking at pharmacodynamics with gene expression. We now have good techniques for pharmacogenomics as far as looking at gene expression for multiple uh, genes in a result of therapy. And this was a study that was done looking um, in muscle cells. And this has been proposed and is now being looked at by Heather Kanich working with Scott Stanley at UC Davis on what are the real effects of corticosteroids? How long do they last? Um, they're probably gonna be even longer than the therapeutic effects that we saw in our clinical models. So back to the New York Task Force recommendations. They're certainly consistent with science. And as I mentioned before, this is a phenomenal study and I'm, I just a lot of work that's been done. But the important parts here relevant to the subject today, the intra-articular administration of methylprednisolone within 15 days of the race. So in other words, the recommendations of the task force, and I understand by talking to Dr. Palmer that chaired the force that these have all been taken on board and are going to be instituted, but one of the recommendations was to amend rule 4043.2 on an emergency basis to prohibit the intra-articular administration of Depamedrol within 15 days of the race, the intra-articular administration of all other corticosteroids within seven days of the race, and the administration of all systemic corticosteroids within five days of the race. And significantly as well, um, they made the conclusions that a pattern of redundant intra-articular corticosteroid treatment had the potential to misrepresent the true clinical condition of the horse and confound the examining veterinarian's pre-race assessment. And it was impossible to determine if the joints of a horse had been injected in the interval preceding the race. So now their recommendation is the record of all intra-articular corticosteroid injections within 30 days of a race will be transferred to the new owner within 48 hours of a claim, in the case of a claiming horse. And for the executive summary of uh, the Jockey Club, um, obviously this is just picking out the top of the executive summary, the reform racing medication rules that were recently updated. The horse should be allowed to compete only when free from the influences of medication, which um, there's a lot of science being done to define it. And the RMTC has commissioned considerable work that we should have the results of by the end of the year. So this is taken from the reformed racing medication rules of the Jockey Club. The following controlled therapeutic medications shall not be administered less than seven days before the scheduled post time. And of course, all of these products are being examined as far as time and uh, testing. So just there's a number of people involved with the research that at least we did at uh, CSU and also alum, a number of funding agencies. Thank you.